Uh, things were going well with the Apostle Paul until he cast a, a fortune-telling demon out of a slave girl. Once he did that, uh, the girl's owners were mad and angry. They had him uh, beaten along with Silas, and they were flogged, and they were thrown into prison. They were in the hole, the most innermost part of, of the prison, hungry, thirsty, hands and feet bound in shackles, a very bad situation. But I want you to know what they were doing at that time, that those you shared on television, Acts chapter 16, verse 25, in the midst of such horrible suffering, the apostle Paul and Silas, the Bible says that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were what? Baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And my subject is salvation is a family affair. Salvation is a family affair. Lord, we ask your blessing upon this message, upon all those who are watching on television, gathered here before us today on Family and Friends Day. Let us continue to put you first in our houses, O oh Lord, and know that we'll be blessed and saved. And we ask your blessing upon this message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is the, the second of three missionary journeys done by the Apostle Paul. Jesus had commanded the apostles, to go out and preach the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth. And this is what Paul and Silas are doing. For the first time, the gospel is being planted in what we call European soil. It's from Europe that the gospel spread out uh, to Africa, spread out to Asia, spread out to North and South America. Paul and Silas are in a big mess in jail right now. But I want those of you who are listening to understand this. They are in a big mess because of obedience to Jesus Christ. Uh, just stay with me on this message. Originally, Paul didn't even want to go there. But supernaturally, an angel came and told Paul to go. I want you to note in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, Paul and his companions traveling through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in province of Asia. Now, no, he keeps them from doing what, what they think they want to do. The Holy Spirit said, mm, don't you do that. When they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them. So for the things that they weren't supposed to do, the Holy Spirit is blocking them. You need to know, you know, God will direct your life and will block you from the things that he doesn't want you to be in or be involved in. But note next. So they passed by my sea and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave you for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is the point in which most Bible scholars believe that Luke the physician uh, joined them because he goes from they to we in his language in these verses. But in addition to that, the apostle Paul was the only one who had that clear vision. And yet the people, the people who were following Paul so believed God was speaking to him, they all went. You see, brothers and sisters, 
Obedience is better than sacrifice. Paul and Silas obeyed what the Lord told them to do. They just followed it. But I want you to see, it got them into a lot of trouble. Obeying God got them into a lot of trouble. This is one of the problems with our prosperity ministries today. I know some of them are doing a great work, but I'm just trying to tell you to give you the illusion that everything in life is peaches and cake and ice cream and that you as a believer can have faith in faith and all of a sudden nothing goes wrong. It's just a flat out lie. Uh, we are in a world where we don't know what's going to happen. I was praying, my wife and I praying like crazy before we left on the cruise praying during the crew, because how can you have a good time away and something happens to your family while you're away? We were praying, Lord, keep our family, watch over our family. God was not under obligation to do it, but because God was just good, he just heard our prayers, and one of our, my, my son-in-law got very sick, and God took care of him. So, ladies and gentlemen, we can't, we can't, we got to get away from this thinking that as Christians, we have been absolved from all bad things happening to us. I think I got some support out here this. I hope you're supporting me on, on television as well. You see, brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us the concept of righteous suffering. I want you to write that down because you don't hear this. You don't hear this in messages. Righteous suffering. We don't hear that. You think about the last time you heard about it. You see, some Christians have a test of moaning. Let me get that on the screen so y'all catch it. There you go. They have a test of moaning. They moaning through everything. Why me, Lord? Why haven't I been able to get a job? Why can't I catch a good man or good husband? She don't even look as good as me, and she's got a what? Why me, Lord? I can't get promoted. Why, why, why is it taking you so long? I call that a test of moaning. Because it challenges the goodness of God in our lives. But mature Christians have a testimony. Ah, I'm going to preach my message. I want you to note 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 to 25. People with a testimony follow the example set by Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter number 2, beginning in verse 20 and sharing on television, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong or even go to jail and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good, for doing good, righteous suffering, and you endure it, this is what? Commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leave you an example, all of us an example that we should what? Follow in his steps. He didn't commit any sin. No deceit was found in mouth. Nothing he suffered was because of any wrong that he did. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. If we will all be honest, there all, all of us have times in our Christian walk where we have had a testimony. I don't care how strong the Christian is. You know, I've had mine. I've had them. I'm moaning and crying and upset, blaming God. Now, you, I'm just obeying you. Now, look at the mess you done got me into. But ladies and gentlemen, it's one thing to say those things. It's another thing, though, to, to walk away from God and to walk away from the church. Sometimes we get angry with the people we love, but that don't mean we got to leave them. That means we got to deal with what's made us angry and try to move forward in the relationship. And so God can do things that maybe we don't fully understand, and maybe it upsets us and gets us down, but your mind's got to be made up to walk with Jesus. And the Bible tells us at a time when we would understand why Paul and Silas would be all messed up, Note what the Bible says that they were doing. The Bible says in the midst of suffering, Paul and Silas were praising God. And the prisoners were what? 
listening. You see, unbelievers are watching how you handle being unjustly treated as a Christian. They're watching you. They're watching how you handle being lied on. They're watching, let me just throw it on you, me too, I'm a Christian. They're watching how we handle suffering verbal and, and physical abuse. They watch how we handle being cheated and being wrong. The Bible says at midnight, instead of cursing men, they were praising their God. You see, light shines in the darkness for those that believe and trust in God. I'm going to get some help out here. I want you to note your program cover. Your program cover says light shines in the darkness for the godly. I believe at the midnight hour, they, God gave them just a little bit of light that everything was going to be all right. So instead of cursing and screaming and hollering, they decided since I'm in the jail, I might as well give my God some praise. I feel some anointing up in here now. You see, brothers and sisters, if you're going to be in some mess that you can't get out of, why not praise him while you're in it? If you can't get out of the mess, then praise him while you're in the mess. Because let me tell your neighbor real fast, say you may not know it, but the prisoners are listening. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You see... These people, Paul and Silas, were mature. They were determined to get God to glory, no matter what it takes. I'm now saved 38 years. I, I, I'm not a part of this wrong thinking that just because I serve God that everything's going to go my way. A lot of things don't go my way. A lot. But I'm mature to the place. I want God to get the glory. Yes, the prisoners were listening. But it appears the jailer had also heard the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. When he saw the prison doors open, he was getting ready to kill himself for the simple reason that the Romans were going to execute him anyway for dereliction of his duty. So he said, I might as well just kill myself. Now I want you to know verses 28 to 30 of Acts 16. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do? To be saved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is unbelievable. Now, let's just be modern. None of the prisoners left and the doors was open. <laughs> I did ministry for years. Cook County, Stagesville, Metropolitan Correctional Center. Trust me, if those doors open. Feet don't fail me now. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, they were there. Maybe they didn't leave because Paul and Silas had the words of eternal life. Maybe they didn't leave because as they listened to those words, even though they were in jail, physically, but mentally, and then in their hearts, maybe the gospel was setting them free. See, it's one thing to be physically bound. It's another thing to be mentally and heart bound. And as they were listening to these men praise God, I think it became clear to them, whatever Paul and Silas had, they needed to get that too. See, this is what, when you go through suffering, it ought to produce People ought to look at you 
and say, look, it's not humanly possible for you to have the health challenges that you had and you still got to praise for God. It's not humanly possible for you to have suffered the loss of a loved one and yet you still are coming to church. It's not humanly possible for you to go through a divorce that was so vicious and so bad, but yet you have not quit up and gave up on Jesus. When things like that happen to you and people see you in the midnight hour praising and lifting up God, when it says to them, you got something that they need. And what they need is the Holy Ghost. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why they were all still there. He whom the Son says free is free indeed. Equally amazing is the jailer's question. What must I do to be saved? Where does that come from? I want you to note this on screen, just very quick, Gweek. It's, it's important. Because we talk about we're saved and people don't know quite what that means. It's from the Greek word soso. The Greek word soso just means in general deliverance. That's really, it's deliverance. So you can be saved from drowning. You can be saved by hitting from a car. It, it means deliverance. But when we talk about salvation, it means two principal things in relationship to deliverance. One, to be delivered from the penalty of sin, which is hell. Secondly, it means to be delivered from the power of sin, which happens when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, which I'm going to open the church doors in a few moments. Hope someone will come down to get baptized in Jesus' name and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like many people, I believe this jailer had a guilty conscience, but a sincere heart. When you come to God and he's dealing with you, there's no way God is not dealing with you and he's not convicting you of your sins that you've done in your life. See, all of us have sins that we not even share with everybody. All of us got deep pockets and things we have done that nobody except God Almighty will ever know what we did. We hide it because we're ashamed of it. But a part of being born again is that you get this sense that if you give your life to God, he can cleanse you from your sins. And so what God does, he looks past the evil and the wrong and the sin that a person has done. He sees the sincerity of their heart, and he wants that person to be right with God because now that person is saying, I just want to be right with God. I just want the load of sin to be lifted off of me. I believe that's why the jailer answered that question. Well, then how do you get right with God? Paul tells them in verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You and your household. Put your total confidence, put your total trust in Jesus. Now, as I wrap this up, I want you to know that this jailer's salvation was a family affair. The Bible tells us in verses 32 to 34, they spoke to the word of the Lord. You got to hear the word to get saved. Everybody in the house, at the at that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Immediately, he and all his household were what? Baptized. Brought them forth. Gave them food. There was great joy in the house. The whole family baptized. The same thing happened when Lydia was, was saved. The Bible says in Acts 16, verses 14 and 15, that she listened to the preaching. This woman from Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth, but she was already a worshiper, but she wasn't saved. She could only go as far as what you know. But the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's mess. I don't care how good a preacher thinks he is or she is. If the Holy Spirit is not working through that preacher or pastor, you can't save a single soul because the heart of people is too hard. The heart of people, only God can take a heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. He'll work through our words and our message and our stories and our personality, but don't you ever think that you all of that. It's about God making a decision that he would use us. 
us weak vessels of clay. Moses, you know the famous words of Joshua as he prepared to die. As for me, in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. The first Gentile conversion in Acts chapter 10, the house of Cornelius, the Bible tells us when Cornelius was, was saved, he and his whole household were saved. Tell your neighbor again, salvation is a family affair. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when women and children get saved first in the family, 33% of the time, the whole family gets saved. But when a man gets saved, when the brother is the first one in the family saved, 90% of the time, the entire family gets saved. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it speaks to our role as men, as being leaders in our home. How can we be a leader in our home and our leadership is not based on spirituality? How can we be a leader in our home and our leadership is not based on our personal relationship with God? Well, let me put it this way. How can we be leaders in our home and we're not clear who's leading us? I'm just saying this to you, brothers. I've not found too many women that won't follow a man that's following God. Just saying, just saying. God saves individuals, but whenever applicable, he brings salvation to the entire family. God works through the family because it's the building block of the church and our society. I wonder if one of the reasons our families are so dysfunctional today is because we have turned from the church to the world. I wonder. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to Israel and said these words to them in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Very powerful passage. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. But my people, my people, Israel, have exchanged their glorious God for what? Worthless idols. Be it Paul that did you heaven and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, number one, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. As I begin to end my message, America has committed those same two sins. We have forsaken the one true God. There's only one God, so I hope you come out to these classes and get a better understanding of who this one true God in the midst of a multiplicity of gods in this world. The greatest God is secularism, where we become gods in our own minds. Doing what we want, acting like we want to act, don't care what nobody says, nobody can hold us accountable, we just do what we feel like, that's a God. But I want you to note this also. The second sin America has committed is digging out cisterns that can hold no water. Let me give you this brief illustration as I end this message. We see the water, of course. We got two pots that are they're pretty similar, I would say. I needed a, a little something to put something on here. They didn't give me that, but that's all right. I think I can make it work. <clears throat> they, look, they look pretty similar. The difference is if you take this pot and you pour out of it what you pour in, comes right back out. Let me ask you a question. What are you pouring yourself into? What are you pouring your time, your energies, your resources in that when you pour into it, you got nothing to show for it? And that's how some people live, live their life. They pour their time and energy uh, into immorality into money, into thinking things and stuff, going after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. And when it's all said and done, after all their energies have been put into those things, all they watch it do, pour it in, and it comes right back out. My brothers and sisters, in life, in the end, it's about what you keep. It's about what you keep. Know what the Bible says in Proverbs 23 and 5, those who so pouring yourself into the things of this world. 
cast but a glance at Richard, and they are gone. They will surely sprout wings and fly off the sky like an eagle. Some people poured their time and energy into, into being successful, to having all this money, and neglected their family, their health, everything. And then all of a sudden, the stock market crashes. Don't, all they poured themselves into, they got nothing. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, as you look at this particular pot, you got to pour yourself into the things that you keep. Your time, your energy, your priorities have to be poured into God, into family, into others. You got to pour yourself into the things that you're going to ultimately keep. God, family, and others. As this message ends, isn't it interesting that the people who leave a good legacy in their life are the people who have put themselves last? Isn't that interesting? They put God first, others second, and themselves last. But when they leave here, and I watch their funerals, people who didn't hit the headlines, but in their family and in their friends and in their impact on people's lives that were so great, three, four, five hundred people are in here because they invested themselves into God, into their family, into their friends. Your investment in people is the investment that pays off because people are more important than my members know my saying. Thank you, Joe. I, that's a saying from me at Victory. People are more important than things. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org. 